Welcome back, friends. Today, I drove about four hours through the rain right behind semi-trucks where they were spitting up into my face and I couldn't see anything just to meet with this guest that was in Eau Claire not long ago. But unfortunately, we had to make it happen down here. Our guest today, uh, I guess I don't know exactly where he's from, but he's the Boston guy if you look him up on the internet, but he's a whole lot more than that. So welcome to the show, Bill Doucette. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Billy Deuce. Where'd the nickname come from? I mean, obviously, like it sounds like your name, but where'd the Deuce come from? Billy Deuce um, has something that friends called me in high school back in Massachusetts. A um, couple of buddies of mine called me Billy Deuce. Um, and then my father's name is also Bill Doucette. So when he was in high school, his nickname was Deuce or Billy Deuce. Oh, cool. So, so. your your social medias are Billy Deuce 86 because you were born in 86? Yes. Why? Okay, yes. cool. <laughs> I just assumed so. Yeah, I'm going to change that to 96 pretty soon. There you go. Get 10 years back. Hey, man. I mean, I was born <laughs> in 90. But yeah, once you get north of 30, all of a sudden, you're I'm going to hey, drop I'm the not, number. I'm not a young guy. Well, can you get Billy Deuce? Somebody has to have it, I assume. Somebody right? probably has Billy yeah. Deuce. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about who Billy Deuce is. A lot of people know you again as being like the Boston guy that's in all the Charlie Barron stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But you're a lot more than that. You're a musician. You're a stand-up comedian. You do a lot of content on YouTube. What all is it that you kind of do? Yeah, so I am a musician by trade. That's what I've been doing for, you know, my whole life, doing recording, engineering, and I play a number of instruments. And this and is your studio? This is my studio, cool. yep. Uh, Charlie actually is the partner in this, so it's our studio. He's also a musician. I don't know if you knew that. I did, <laughs> yeah. He put out an album yeah. with Adam um, from Horseshoes and yes, Hand Adam Grenades. A second, they did two albums. Two albums, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so we have this place together. Charlie's not able to get here much, but I'm here all the time because yeah. I can play my guitars and hang out. But, um, yeah, I've been in music my whole life. Got into comedy a few years ago um, via Charlie. We did a video together when I was visiting. Just He was like, hey, you want to be in a video? And uh, so I was in the video, and it did really, really well. It was uh, basically the East Coast versus the Midwest. So he picks me up, and we go for a drive. I saw that one. And yeah. it just blew up. Um, and so I just started doing more and more stuff with him, and it just sort of snowballed into a, sort of a new avenue for me. You weren't doing comedy before that at all? No, not really. No. Oh, okay. I mean, I've done some acting. Um, I mean, comedy. I love comedy. I'm, I like to think I'm a funny person. You're <laughs> absolutely hilarious. People, I got to see you when you performed at the Pablo Center. You were the opener for Charlie's show, yeah. which I wasn't even planning on going to that show. It sold out and everything. And then a friend of mine just texted me randomly that he couldn't go anymore. Oh, so those okay. tickets just like fell into my lap, which oh, was nice. my first exposure to you. So I actually got to see your stand up, which was awesome. Although Thank you did you. make fun of all of Wisconsin to start the show. But. I did. Yeah. I'd like to start the show by alienating 90% of the audience. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, I mean, I've always been a huge fan of movies, television, probably to a fault, a little too much consumption of movies and television. Um, I didn't show you in the other room, but I collect VHS tapes. Oh, cool. Which is a very weird and inexpensive hobby. Well, yeah, dude, go to thrift sales and you used to, I don't know if they do anymore. Now these trends are all coming back, but you could find VHS tapes for a dollar in bins at thrift yeah. so, like, sales all the time. That's exactly what I would do. I would go around in New England. We have a chain called Savers and they're thrift. We have shops. them here. Oh, you got Savers? Okay, yeah. good to know. So I would just go and buy a bunch of tapes and, you know, I watch some of them, but it's just a weird hobby of mine like i have box i probably have 1200 tapes in that other room over there wild yeah that's actually um random parallel in skateboarding uh the brands fa and hockey fa stands for fucking awesome <laughs> which okay. is hilarious but they're like big brands uh the owner jason dill uh a, a lot of his creative stuff comes from that like people have asked where he gets graphic ideas and things from, and it's from finding VHS tapes oh, that don't really? have labels, watching them, and then coming up with ideas. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah, I've got, I mean, it's not like, I may have one or two tapes that have some actual value. Like if you have a fully sealed original release of like Ghostbusters, it was sure. never opened. That's going to have value. Yeah. But mostly I just have like eight shitty copies of Forrest Gump and Sick. Mrs. Doubtfire. I didn't see Forrest Gump for the first time <laughs> until like fairly recently. I was never like a media person. And then I'll go on these weird little spurts where I'm like, I'm going to get caught up on famous things. And I'll watch like five really famous movies in the course of one week. And then I won't for six more months. Okay. But Forrest Gump was one of the ones relatively recently where I'm like, I can't. And I cast away was another one where I'm yeah. like, I've never seen these. Mo Anyways, let's get back to what we were talking about. So you. You live in Wisconsin now. Mm -hmm. You met Char you met Charlie in high school. Yeah. So, so you so you've moved around. 
how are you Boston guy, but still a Wisconsin guy? Give me more of like the understanding of what that actually looked like. Yes, it is confusing. Um, and for that reason, I do get a lot of people commenting that are like, you're not from Boston. They're like, yeah. how come you don't have an accent in this video? And I guess to some extent they're right. But my uh, family, extended family back for generations has always been in the Boston area. Yeah. My parents are both from Boston. I'm the only person in my family history that I know of for hundreds of years that was not born in New England. <laughs> okay. I was born in Annapolis, Maryland. My dad's job, I moved around a ton as a kid. So I lived in Maryland, Michigan, Oregon, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Okay. And then moved back to Massachusetts um, when I was 14. So I've been in Massachusetts for, you know, I'm 38 now. So I think I've done enough time in Massachusetts yeah. to call myself a native. But um, yeah, I've been there for... 22 years. So how long did you live in Wisconsin before that? Not very long. Uh, I was here for eighth, uh, seventh and eighth grade. Yeah. Then we moved to Boston. Then I moved back here for a year. Okay. And then I moved back to Boston and I've been back in Boston for like over a little over 20 years. Okay. So, so let's talk the music thing. Cause I didn't realize that you did, like I knew you played music, but the only music I've actually heard of you, yours is the like comedic stuff. Which yeah. obviously isn't all you've done, right? So no. how did, what was your music trajectory of that side of your career? I, uh, so I actually been playing guitar since about the third grade. Um, I heard the Beatles in the second grade, which was like a big, I became obsessed with the Beatles, yeah. which is not a unique experience, right. but sure. I heard the Beatles, like my dad's old records. I would listen to them in my room and just became enamored with all things Beatles. So I wanted a guitar. Got an electric guitar for Christmas and still have it. It's that red one hanging up there. Oh, cool. Still have that one. And it's just been a nonstop ride of acquiring guitars and microphones and gear. I just became obsessed with recording, with audio. Um, and then I got into playing the drums and... So, so have you always more so been on the side of like a studio musician or did you, were you in a band for a while performing yeah, a lot of places or been in a lot of bands, a lot of tribute bands, a lot of cover bands, um, usually as the guitarist or usually, yeah, okay. guitarist and, and vocalist. And, um, f until I got into this comedy thing, uh, recently, you know, that was my primary source of income. I was playing bars, you know, three or four nights a week. Oh, um, a lot of what I would do was not full band. Um, I used to do tons of full band stuff and it just became so much more complicated because you've got four to six guys or gals splitting peanuts, getting yeah. home at four in the morning with like 60 bucks in your pocket. Yeah. Cause the venue doesn't want to pay six times as much. No, <laughs> they'll the venue, pay the same <laughs> venues in music have not changed what they pay a band since 1974 oh, God. like you know as most venues there are some that understand and pay better but like you go play you know o'brien's pub or something or you know whatever yeah with your band you're not getting paid much right um and it didn't be it became just not sustainable as much fun as it is to play in a full band but what i did was i shifted it to just doing me with my acoustic and I got so much more work and so much more money doing that. Right. So that's what I was doing and have started doing it again, actually, recently because I missed it. But um, yeah, I mean, that was my my income was was professional musician for, you know, most of my life. Did you put out a bunch of albums and stuff or was it mostly doing cover things? Mostly covers. And then I I'm an audio engineer and I record. So. I've had a lot of uh, recorded a lot of other people's music. Yeah. Do you um, specialize in any sp like specific kind? I wouldn't really? say I specialize in any specific kind. I would say I have no experience or knowledge recording like electronic music or like hip hop oh, yeah, kind okay. of stuff. Not for any reason. I just, it was never my thing. And so I never really had any artists come through that were doing that. So like I'm more of an analog instruments kind of guy right. you know i'd like to expand my knowledge and be able to make like beats and be able to do what popular music sounds like now but 
just haven't gotten into that. Well, yet. and there's so much genre overlap at this point. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like there's rappers that then will have actual instruments, not yes. just beat machines and stuff. And no, there's only more and more and more of that. Like starting to become a big thing. Like I'm starting to see a lot of reintegration of live musicians into hip hop and and rap and yeah. Well, and not uh, only that, pop. like. I've shouted him out on the show too many times, but Sun Reels, like my favorite music artist, he was number one. Well, he was number five most streamed artists on Spotify for me. But then I got to interview him in Minneapolis when he was coming through on tour, and now he's been number one of my streams. But Who anyways, Sun Reel, Sun Reel, okay, yeah, he's from uh, Vancouver, but he came up in the rap industry. He had a so- has a song on YouTube called "Everywhere We Go." Like the music video has forty million streams. Like he blew oh, up nice. kind of overnight with that song ten more than ten years ago. Um, but as he got older, and he still like he's putting out a whole hip hop album at the moment. Um, but he put out, I want to say two albums that were almost exclusively more like folk singing. Oh, okay. So it really is like a mixture of mm-hmm. all that. And there's a lot more artists that are kind of going that route. Yeah, Let's get sure. back to comedy though. So, cause that's where a lot of people are discovering you right mm-hmm. now, um, oh, yeah. kind of through Charlie. So I'm assuming you, you knew Charlie as a kid and then yes. you reconnected in some, for some reason, how did that happen? Yeah. So I, the short period of time I lived in Wisconsin, I loved it here when I was a kid. I loved it. It took me very little time to fit in, make friends, which isn't always the case in different areas in the country. But, you know, Wisconsin has a reputation for friendlier people for a reason. Um, So when I moved here, I just made this amazing group, core group of friends in seventh and eighth grade. And And that was Milwaukee area. Yeah, it was Brookfield, Wisconsin. Yeah, So eh, 20 minutes from here. Sure. Um, And so when I would come back and visit, you know, I would do that probably twice a year because I was so close with this group of friends. And Charlie had integrated into the group. Um, he always went to Catholic schools. Yeah. So I was in public schools, so I didn't know him very well. But then in 10th grade, we were hanging out a lot and became close friends. Sure. And I would go back and visit a couple times a year, stayed in touch with everybody. And, you know, people's weddings and whatnot, always seeing people and... Went to a buddy's wedding about five or six years ago and saw Charlie there. And we're, you know, drinking, having a good time. And I just started doing, like, impressions. Okay. And, you know, just started goofing around. And, you know, he just kind of locked in on it. Like, when he sees something funny or a good idea, he's like, the notepad comes out. And he's like, oh, it's great. Do that again. And he started filming me and stuff. Yeah. And so that was sort of the seed that planted working with him yeah. because he kept in his mind like, oh, Bill's funny. I should put Bill on some stuff. And ultimately, we did end up doing that video on one of my visits. And then that's just kind of what kicked it all off. Wow. Yeah. Well, and Charlie hasn't been like the name that he is currently. That really blew up significantly over just the last few years. Yeah. So at that point in time, talking five years ago, it's not like he was a huge content creator at the time. No, not certainly. I don't think at the level he is now, but he was get he was growing exponentially um, at that time. And yeah, like you said, I think over the last like three years, it's really been yeah trajectory for so him. So you, because that's a big part of your career at this point, I would assume, because you're traveling around with him and everything. You mm-hmm. don't have time to be recording other things. What was the first like? When did that become? your career like what was it a tour that he was like hey will you come with and do this where you're like okay i'm gonna put everything else relatively on pause to focus on this or at what point did it switch where you're like doing comedy not exclusively with charlie but like doing comedy was going to become part of your career probably like two years ago it took over more of of my time and became the primary focus um were you living here at the time no i was still living in boston doing videos in boston flying out here a lot to work with him And it just got to the point that I was coming here so often and so much of what I was doing was based out of Wisconsin that it just made sense to get an apartment here and and move here. Um, And that was, I've been here for about a year. Um, But yeah, so I get back to Boston, you know, as as often as I can because I got a lot of family, nieces and nephews and all that there. Yeah, sure. And I have the freedom... You know, this probably wouldn't have been the case if I wasn't a bachelor, but like I've never been married. I don't have kids. So I was able to be like, you know what? Yeah, I'll try a new thing and yeah. pick up a new endeavor. And it's so far, it's great. So, yeah, I mean, it opened up a lot of doors. Mm-hmm. You know, I was listening to a song the other day and it was with that. I'm assuming, you know, Anderson Pock, 
that artist. I don't know that I do. Yeah, he has a song with Bruno Mars that's really okay. great. But he's he's like a rapper, but also a singer. But anyways, in the song, he says something along the lines of like, "I can open the doors, but if you can't hold the key, that's all I can do for you." You know um, what I mean? Which is like what's happening with Charlie as far as like getting you in front of some people. Like that's one part of it. But for you to build your own career, it's ultimately up to you to be able to create your own content with your own ideas and to be able to do stand up on your own and be successful yeah. in all those things. He can get you in front of some people by bringing you on tour or whatever. But like if you suck, you suck. You still have to build everything yourself. And I think a lot of times people think that people are just riding coattails. Yeah. But it doesn't work that way, man. If somebody's dead weight, they're, they'll be dropped. doesn't matter how good of friends you are. Business is a business. You yeah. Know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the opportunities I've had have been, um, you know, the, the paying your dues as a comedian means doing small clubs, doing open mics, working for years and years and years at it. So I don't want to say I got to skip some, some yeah. of my dues or whatever, but I did all of a sudden find myself in front of, a theater full of people doing stand up, and that's not the typical route, right? Um, so because, like you said, like because of Charlie's fame and and co um, I was sort of riding his coattails and experiencing like these big productions and these you know thousands of people um, before I had really put in a lot of time in smaller sure. clubs and stuff. And you know, I don't have a stage any stage fright issues or anything like that, which is great because of the music thing. Right. But it did feel weird to get out there. I felt a little bit naked without like a guitar. Right. And the comfort of, oh, I'm going to play this next song. But I did have the advantage of not being inexperienced in entertainment. Sure. So I was able to come out on stage and there's nervousness, but not like straight on stage fright. Right. Um, but the funny thing is, you know, I don't really get nervous or worked up for these big shows like the one you were at and stuff yeah. but if i go to a comedy club where there's other comedians and there's maybe maybe 50 people or less that really scares the shit out of me sure because it's so much more intimate you can right. see the whole audience you can um see reactions in real time and it's it's real it's much more real you know and it i have a much more a hard time with doing that than i do like a big theater which is weird well, yeah, but it's also because I've talked to a lot of stand-up comedians and this is a weird parallel. I always bring up skateboarding, but that's just because that's like where my background came from, right? The, in skateboarding, there's like your pros and then they call them, which is silly, their Instagram pros, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the same kind of parallel of people that went the original, like the regular route of the industry, right? And paying their dues in that kind of way to become a pro skateboarder and build a career. But it's a different world now and there's all these other people that are just as good, you know, or whatever, but they come up on their own platforms, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Through social media and those types of things. And a lot of times they become a lot more successful and then what the traditional pros are. Yeah. Right. And so with comedy, it's a similar thing. I was talking to uh, Sean Patton about it a little bit. And I know that there's some comedians that get frustrated by that because they're like, oh, I did all this, blah, 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 blah. It's like, well, it's, it's a different world now and it's, yeah. a, it's a changing world. And, you know, Charlie, as an example, is incredibly successful and sells out these huge, huge, huge venues for stand up when he is not nearly as experienced as some of these other like purely stand up mm -hmm. comedians. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, it's like it's just a different world, you know, and he's, yeah. he's has a different type of audience too. But I would imagine if you go to like a true comedy club or whatever, then all of a sudden now the people that are watching you, you feel like are they're critiquing and watching your actions when you know that they've put in all this work in like the traditional path. Yes. So I would assume you get a little bit of a like imposter syndrome kind of a feeling. I do. From it. Yeah. No, I have a pretty bad case of that. Um, I try to just, you know, look at it like, Hey, I got lucky with this particular connection and try not to feel too guilty about some of the steps that I've gotten to skip, but I'm also trying to go back and do smaller clubs and go to open mics and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if, if traditional stand up comics, um, had social media in the nineties or the early two thousands, it would have been a lot different for them for sure, because that used to be the Avenue was, do all these open mics maybe, or these shows, maybe you'll get a special if you can get the attention of Comedy Central or HBO or right. whomever, or or an appearance on one of the late night shows. That was your break. 
Right. And until you broke through there, there was that barrier where you, you're just at a ceiling of how many people are going to come see you and know who you are. Social media has just blown the doors off of that. And anybody who's willing to commit the time and has some talent and is funny can achieve a following pretty quickly yeah. if they're talented and if it's good stuff. And so it's just a different age where comedians can do just sketches and little bits and then get these amazing opportunities and deals with Netflix or well, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like acting though, you know, well it is acting, but it's kind of like how there are comedians that Eddie Murphy is an example, right. That like did stand up, you know, forever or whatever, but then made their money in movies and it's a different lane. Like it's still comedy, but it's a different lane. It's a whole nother part of the career and not everybody wants to do that, Mm -hmm. but like that's, that's its own respectable lane. So let's talk about the uh, first like tour that you guys did. You started getting into comedy, um, but it was all sketch based stuff. When did you decide you were going to do stand up, and did you put together like a huge, like a, a 30 minute thing to be able to do your own sets places or was it exclusively you were just going with Charlie to open? Like, just going with him. I've done a couple little shows on my own or, or, or other people's shows, but uh, it's mostly been with him. And the first time I did it, um, he was actually coming to do a show in Boston. Okay which we're doing another show in Boston this year. Um, but he's like, oh, Bill, you want to do some time in Boston? So I jumped at that opportunity and um, I wrote like 10 minutes maybe. Yeah. And the reason I did about 10 as opposed to five or what usually a, a opener does is because I had a lot of friends and family coming to this theater. Yeah. So that really helped me a lot too, knowing that I had support out in the audience. It was... Um, a theater called the Wilbur in Boston, which I want to say is probably about 1200 people. Oh, it's a big crowd. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Uh, maybe about a thousand. I'm not sure exactly, but, uh, so yeah, that was the first time I did it and it went pretty well. Um, surprisingly, you know, that was the first time, time you did stand up at yeah. all. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's a big crowd for, and a lot of pressure for your first time. It was, it was, um, and then I did, um, shortly after that we did, a bunch of dates in Florida at this really little club. Um, well, not really little, but a small club called uh, Off the Hook Comedy. And I want to say it's Naples. Okay. But because it was a smaller place when when he does a run, ideally you're going to do a, a, two nights at a huge place. And But he had to break it up. So we did like, I want to say six shows. Oh, cool. And that really gave me a really good consistent three nights in a row, two shows a night to uh just kind of get get my act down and stuff like that uh, yeah. that was more nerve-wracking again because it it's a it was weird because it's a restaurant too okay which so like it's kind of distracting yeah because yeah. like you'll be telling a joke and then like a waiter will go by with a steak to put down on the table in front of you and people are like talking and eating so it was a little bizarre yeah but still a good experience, right. you know, um, uncomfortable situations like that. I just have to be ready for that. Yeah. And get used to that. Like when I did a show recently, um, I can't remember where we were, but it was a big theater and the people in the first row were just talking oh, and like no. talking like at me, like to me, like it was a two way <laughs> conversation. Yeah. And that was the first time that it really happened to that extreme. Like sure. I wasn't being heckled or anything. I don't think I've been heckled yet. But uh, it was just like, Jesus, like, shut, will you shut the hell up? Like, did you come here to have a conversation <laughs> yeah, in the front yeah. row? Yeah. But, um, but yeah, the, the first experience was the Boston show, and um, it went well. It wasn't, I didn't bomb or anything, so I stuck with it after, after that. Approximately, if you had to just guesstimate, how many shows have you done? Because you guys have been mm. traveling, and you've done a whole bunch by now, but... Yeah, I mean, he uh, that tour, he does rotate the openers. Like, there's a few people that changes it up. So I'm not on every show. Right. Adam's – does Adam do a lot of them too, or was that just an Eau Claire thing because he was in the area? No, Adam Gruel does a lot of them, um, and I think a big part of it is because the new album, to right. promote the new album, because yeah. they do a few songs from their new comedy album. Yep. And what Adam does when he comes out is he does a couple of songs and does some jokes. Right. Uh, he's on a lot of them, but he's also in like 10 bands. Right, sure. So he's not able to make every date. Yeah. Um, he has Andy Rafi from Chicago on there. Um, Tom Johnson from Milwaukee, who's great, who's 
out in LA with him right now. But I would say I've done, I don't know, less than a hundred. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it is relatively new. What's your goals? What goals do you have for comedy specifically? Are you trying to stay, are you trying to get more and more into the lane of doing stand up and eventually be a headliner for your own things? Or do you want to stay more in the space of content creation, YouTube shorts, that type of a thing? I would say stand up is not like a passion for me. For a lot of people, it's like they love right. doing it and it's their lifestyle and it's their whole world. I enjoy doing it, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't be telling the truth if I said that I aspire to keep getting bigger and bigger in stand up. Yeah. Um, I want to keep doing it, but what interests me more is sketches and doing comedy that's on film, you know, like um, I'd love to do some acting. Yeah. Um, even if it's just a bit part, you know, I'd, I'd like to break into that. That that's probably more compelling to me. How do you chase that comedian. living here in Wisconsin? I don't know. I don't <laughs> it's know. pretty difficult to I do, know. right? Um, you kind of have to be in LA. Be some inevitable trips to LA, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. you know, in in this day and age, it's kind of the nice thing about technology and social media is that you can kind of live somewhere that's not the epicenter of the entertainment industry and still get work, whether it's voiceover or whatever, because you can just jump on a plane and be there you know well not only that but like being on tv or whatever dude charlie can make a video that gets way more views than something that is on comedy central yeah you know what i mean so like the acting is like it's it's it sounds awesome to be able to be in you know say like wise kids you know would be like an example of like Mm -hmm. a sketch comedy show right that was on comedy central but of those videos people have seen like all of them right like a ton of people have seen them however there are ones that you could just make with charlie when you're on tour that you're acting and doing the same general thing you're just not in a studio but it reaches even more people and yeah. make you can make more of a career out of it so it's like all kind of blending in that it way is. yeah it totally is i think it's just uh because of my affinity for film and television and uh it's just always been attractive to me to get to experience like a film set or a TV set. Yeah. It's like a life goal. Yeah. Yeah. Just to yeah experience yeah. that, um, you know, to be in a just small role in a TV episode or a independent film or whatever. That's something I would definitely jump at. Dude, I want to do a voice acting thing mm-hmm. at some point in time. So far I've been in one music video and all I was doing was making out with this girl in a hot tub. Oh, that's not bad. For all three minutes. And then I had to do it twice <laughs> so it was a uh, um, music video where the the singer was in a suit and he was sitting in a hot tub like depressed right and my role was me and this girl had to make out like in front of him so we were like in the foreground mm. and we did it for the full three three and a half minutes long of the song and then the director and the, the whole crew was there there's like 25 people just like watching us super awkward yeah <laughs> did it is. and then he was like that was great can you do it again Ah. And so <laughs> we had to do it again. At least he didn't so say that's, we that's, weren't rolling. Yeah, that's my. Oh no, he was rolling. But so or that was my entire said, acting career to this point in time. <laughs> or if he had said, "Okay, great, um, thanks for your help," and the girl was a stand-in, and she got up and left, oh, and they no. brought in uh, somebody who wasn't as attractive. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, that would that would also be a bummer. So how do you you guys still make a lot of content together? Obviously, like you and Charlie, but you have your own like YouTube that has 90,000 subscribers or something like you have your own things. How do you decide when you make stuff with Charlie, how do you decide where it goes? Uh, usually, um, I, my goal is to do two of my own videos a week. Okay. Which isn't really that ambitious a goal, but it's, you know, for now I try to get two videos out a week that are just mine. And then whenever it pops up, I'll be in one of Charlie's or whatever. Yeah. And then sometimes I'll write an idea and, and it'll be for Charlie's videos. Sure. Um, a lot of what I do with him, um, I, what I bring to the table is like the one liners and the jokes. Yeah. I don't have a great, um, skill set with writing because writing really is a skill and there actually are, you know, steps to a well-written piece that I don't fully comprehend. Sure. You know, there's, there's a, there's an arc to a story and you sort of have to follow these, these traditional things. And so I can't really structure a good script, but I can contribute to the humor of it. And that's, I think where I'm able to contribute. Yeah. 
Um, he did give me a couple books that are about writing. <laughs> he was like, you're not good enough yet. Let me show you. The problem the is I don't read <laughs> and I have yeah. not voluntarily read a book since probably the eighth grade. Oh no. I just don't read. And then through high school, I would just lie and not read the book and not get a good grade on the exam. That was just the way it was. Sure. But like, if you give me a book, like people will give me books for Christmas or whatever. And I, it's almost like getting a pair of socks. I'm like, Oh cool. Thank you. Yeah. And I've never read a book that someone gave me. I just, I think it's probably a concentration thing or like, sure. a, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's not like I'm dyslexic or anything. I mean, I can read, <laughs> I, I am so. literate, <laughs> but I just choose the you just choose not film and television. Yeah, sure. You know, if someone says to me, dude, oh, did you like that movie? You should read the book. I'm like, well, no. Yeah. Because that's going to take me eight hours or right. a week. Sure. And I just watched the movie and now I know what it's about. Sure. And I know there are cases where the yeah. book is infinitely better. Right. But, but I, you know, things are changing though. Like the longer form YouTube, I understand you can make more money off that doing the whole story arc, but people don't want to watch a horizontal camera anymore. People mm -hmm. just want to watch vertical and you can't like to reach a lot of people. All the platforms that are successful with that now are vertical short form limited to usually 60 seconds. Yeah. So there's only so much you can do. And yes, you could do like a part one, part two, part three, part four type thing, which can potentially work. But I think what's working the best now is just figuring out how you can condense something into that. And mm -hmm. there's only so much story you can really have. Like you can have characters, mm -hmm. obviously like Charlie Barron's is a very much a character, your Boston character, like that's specific to that. But there's only so much you can really do with that. I think yeah. the one-liners is what really works for that type of content. Yeah. Anyways, so so uh, maybe I'm in the right place at the right time for that because for me, it's all about just, you got to, you know, like a 60 second video, you got to, it's all about making every line count. Every line, if something's not funny, get rid of it. Right. Everything has to be a laugh. And then you save the best laugh as the punch at the end. Yeah. And but you have to have a strong enough hook too. Yeah, and a premise, a, a compelling premise for it. Because that's what people do. If they're not interested within the first, I want to say 10 seconds, but really it's Dude, probably it's like, like three. You know, yeah, it's right away. They're sitting there on the bus or on the toilet or whatever, and they're just thumbing through that thing, and it's got to grab them. Um, and that took me a while to wrap my head around. I wasn't getting great numbers, and it was just because what I wanted to do and how I wanted to approach it is not the way you're going to get views. Let's talk about one of your favorite videos then. Pick one of the ones that is one of your favorites and tell me the story of how you made that. I think one of the best videos that I've done happened to be one with Charlie. And he it's one of his favorite videos as well. Um, I forget what we called it. It was like Bad First Date or something like that. <laughs> I love that one. And we went to a bar in Milwaukee, the High Note, like karaoke bar, when they weren't open so we could film. And the premise of the sketch was that Charlie was there on a first date with this girl. Um, her name's Re Serena. I can't remember her last name. She's a really good actress, really beautiful. She was awesome. But um, the premise was he's with this girl, and then it pans out, and I'm there, just a random dude who was at the bar. Yeah. And I'm just chiming in and kind of ruining his date and kind of hitting on the girl. And he eventually becomes like, a third wheel to our yeah. situation and we start connecting and singing together. I'm like, Oh, you like this song? And we sing it together. And uh, eventually I leave with the girl Yeah, and Charlie's just sitting there at the bar alone. It's worth a watch. Yeah. It, but I think it's hilarious. The reason it went, it went really well in my opinion was because we did a lot of improv. Oh, sure. And I, that's just what I prefer. It makes for me, if you do it well, it's more convincing than reading lines. We had a premise, we had a structure, we had, you know, all that. And we did make sure we hit all the marks we needed to hit, but a lot of it was just improv Yeah. And I think that he and I do that well together and that, that sketch really yeah. was good. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I like that one. Yeah, I like that one. I really liked your bar tips one. Which kind of was like oh, yeah, similar. Oh yeah, the other day. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. That one was really funny. I love all the Boston stuff. Obviously, yeah. You're crushing on the short form, and I think a lot of that is the case. It's it's better. It, it's unfortunate to say, but it, it's true. It is quantity over quality currently. Mm -hmm. You just kind of have to do that. But if somebody made this analogy or told me the story of. Have you heard about the the pottery class like analogy? Have you heard that one no. before? No. So this 
teacher has a pottery class and they say, we're going to, I'm going to grade you and you have two options. By the end of the semester, you can either just make one, just your best piece of pottery and I can grade that one, or I can grade as many that you make and we'll just do it by weight. Right. Oh, okay. So what do you think is the best piece of pottery that's made? People would think that it's the one that somebody took the semester to make, but in reality, it's not. It's the people who made a ton of them in the meantime because they learn so much every single time, even if they were just haphazardly throwing stuff together, mm. they build up so much experience during that time that by the end of the semester, the things that they're making quickly are better than the things somebody struggled with the entire semester. That makes sense. Right? And yeah. so when you're doing like sta- doing comedy like that and all these little things, you actually do get really good simply because of the reputi- repetition of putting it out and you're not overanalyzing anything either yeah. because you don't have time to overanalyze it. You're just putting those things out. And like I said, it kind of sucks because it's an oversaturated thing of as far as like putting stuff out there but you do end up creating good stuff that way and then you can just whittle it down and get rid of the things that didn't work yeah you know what no, I mean I, you're not you're not a sponsor or anybody else doesn't decide whether you're successful based on your least viewed content right it's on your most viewed content yeah oh yeah i mean i have videos that i don't even think my mom watched i mean i got videos that have like 800 views but then i have some videos that have millions of views right so and it, and there's no rhyme or reason to it that I can tell. Like I'll put something out where I'm like, "This is funny. This will do well," and it's just like pfft, nobody gave a rat's ass. And then I'll put something out that I'm like, "Yeah, it's okay," and it'll just do amazing. Yeah. So it is figuring that out. And over the last like two months or so, I'd say I'm really finally starting to get it and get what is going to do well right. and how to craft it. But yeah, it's if you know, uh, I would spend hours and hours and hours tweaking and editing in premiere a 60 second video and i and i realized like just get it to where it needs to be and put it out it doesn't need to be perfect right and i I find that if i have that mentality and don't nitpick every little thing it's just way easier and way less stressful and it'll do fine you know a video i spend 12 hours on i'll put out doesn't really do that great then I'll come up with an idea in a hotel lobby and just shoot it on my phone, put it up, and it does amazing. Yeah, you know, so who yeah, knows? <laughs> no, I definitely think that's that's the truth. I think when you're trying trying to create something perfect, that first ninety percent will take, let's say, three hours to get ninety percent done with this product. But to get to a hundred percent done is going to take all week. So yeah. is it worth putting all that extra time for the little bit of ten percent potentially better, yeah. or? you could make 10 times as many videos that are at the 90%. Yes. And I think it's it's just a better route. Again, like I said, I think you learn during that process anyways. Thank you for having me in your studio. This has been a, a cool experience coming down and hanging out with the Deuce Man. Yeah, thanks for having, uh, I was gonna say thanks for having me, but I guess we're at my place. Well, I'm about thanks to Thanks for do, having me on the show. Yeah, I'm gonna do all the work. You get to hang out for an hour and a half and then I'll work on it all week posting I look forward clips. to seeing it. Dude, it's gonna be dope. You're gonna get sick of all the notifications from my end. I have a gift for you. I know you don't really drink hot coffee. Maybe you can make this into cold coffee, but I have a bag of coffee and it's from minimum wage tim's which is my buddy tim in minneapolis and he went to school in eau claire and this particular bag these beans are from honduras and it's really good so that's for you if you really hate and you don't want to do it you can give the coffee to somebody else no i'll use it might they might appreciate it it's not that i don't like hot coffee it's that i run so hot and i'm always sweating and stuff yeah that it's the last thing i want but i usually when i make my coffee in the morning you have to make it hot right so what I'll do is I'll have one hot cup and then I'll put the rest in the fridge for the next day. <laughs> so that's what I'll do. And it doesn't have as much sugar as Duncan. That's um, true. <laughs> so I give one bag of coffee to you and then one person listening gets to win a bag of coffee. So the same bag, all you have to do is go find Minimum Wage Tim on Instagram, give him a follow and then DM him this password, which this week is Paul Revere's Coffee Run. So if you DM that password, he's going to pick one winner from the people that DM him, which realistically, because this is a new thing, is not going to be that many people. So you should enter because you got a really good chance of winning. But you get the coffee anyways. Cool. So thank you. good. Thank you, Minimum Wage Tim. Did he come up with Paul Revere's coffee run because of yeah. the Boston thing? Yeah. Oh, I called good. him when I was on my way here and I was like, dude, you need to give me the passwords for these interviews. And I told him who I was interviewing and then he must have done a, a brief amount of research to realize that you are a big lover of, uh, well, you don't love war, but a historian. American history, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially the revolution. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't throw coffee into the harbor. We threw tea into the harbor, so he probably doesn't have a... I saw the video that you did with Charlie of doing that. Throwing the tea in the yeah, harbor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was pretty funny. 
All right. So are you down to do a uh, rapid fire? Yeah. Okay, cool. Because these are like my favorite ones because you don't have to think too much about it. I feel like we get fun little sound bites out of sure. it. And when you do a rapid fire, people, I never get people saying things that they regret, but you just don't have time to think about it. You might So now. it's just quick. Yeah. Well, hopefully. Let's see. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Cool. What's your favorite Girl Scout cookie? Uh, it's one of the peanut butter ones. It's the, uh, there's two peanut butter ones. It's one of those. I forget which one. Mm, I it's should covered in chocolate, but it's peanut butter inside as yeah. opposed to the cookie one. Yeah. You know, that one. What's your favorite, uh, food exclusive that's on the East coast. That's in Boston. Uh, Papa Gino's. What's that? Papa Gino's is a pizza chain. Sure. And they used to have hundreds and hundreds of stores all over New England. They downsized, but there's still probably a hundred of them. What's your order that you get there every time? Just the plain cheese pizza. You are a cheese pizza guy. You're not a meat lovers pizza guy. Uh, I'll eat any pizza, oh, Okay, but Papa Gino's plain cheese pizza to me tastes like childhood. My, sure. my childhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just, a very unique taste and I don't know, it's just It holds nostalgic. a special place in your stomach. Yeah. What's your favorite cartoon as a kid? As a kid, my favorite cartoon was the animated Ninja Turtles show. But now as an adult, what's your favorite cartoon then? Um, you know, I watch a lot of animated adult comedies. Sure. Like Family Guy type stuff? Family or what do you Guy, mean? South Park. Oh, okay. Uh, even though they're competitors and not huge fans of each other, I like both of those shows. Um, I like Bob's Burgers. Um, there's a few I'm forgetting, but I do like adult animation. I think South Park is just like the most genius show. And the fact that they are able to take current events and pump out an episode as fast as they do a, like a news show. Oh, they're is brilliant. Mind blowing. Brilliant. And they've been doing it for as many years as they have. What's the last TV show that you binged? Uh, Seinfeld. How many seasons was there of Seinfeld? Uh, Seinfeld, I want to say it was maybe 10 seasons. I was going to say, it takes a while to pop through that. Did you do I, that as like research for work? No, I'm a huge <laughs> fan of Seinfeld. And basically in my apartment, Seinfeld is basically on a loop. So yeah. at any given moment, I'm in the middle of Seinfeld. Sure. So I guess that's not a true binge. Uh, the last thing I truly binged was, uh, oh God, what was it? Um, the Punisher sick i have not seen that but yeah. i did love that my work yesterday was watching all of your youtube videos yeah that's cool I'm i got glad. to sit up drinking a beer and i was like i'm working right now nice. this is the best okay cats or dogs i'm a dog guy what kind of dog golden retrievers oh the most not, classic and boring yeah. but yeah, not too interesting they're good i have, I have a seven pound miniature pincher uh chihuahua mix i love all dogs he's a little I love terror. dogs what's your most irrational fear oh man i got a lot of irrational fears um I don't, I don't like driving on the highway, um, especially next to trucks. Whenever I'm next to a big truck, I'm convinced that a gust of wind is going to come blow it over <laughs> onto my minivan. Okay. So when you guys go on tour, I know obviously you fly places, but do you guys drive and who's we, the driver? We drive and I'm not a bad driver by any means. I've actually got a pretty clean record, but um, I wouldn't describe Charlie as a great driver. <laughs> okay. uh, neither would anyone that knows him. Sure. So he does not drive, and that's agreed upon. Actually, the road manager is, is Dante's right-hand guy. Is, uh, Don, Charlie's right-hand guy. His name's Dante Williams. He is a great driver. You feel safe taking a snooze while he's driving next to semis. I feel safe. Sometimes he's a little more aggressive than I would be, but you got to be on the road. He also flies planes. Oh, whoa. So I feel like if you can fly a plane. You could drive a car. I, I'm trusting you to drive the vehicle. What's the longest drive you've ever had to be on? Longest drive I ever did. Hmm, that's a great question. Um, it was. It's probably just driving from Milwaukee to Boston or vice versa. Is that like 14 hours? It can be uh, like 16 hours, but realistically, it's more like 18 to 20 hours of road time. Oh, good. Plus, you got to stop to... I usually yeah. stop in Toledo, Ohio and spend the night. Oh, sure. But like my experience doing that drive was also often with my two sisters and my parents. Sure. So you're stopping to... Everybody's on a different yeah, pay yeah, schedule. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? Got you. Okay. What's worse, diet or exercise? Oh, man. Exercise for me. I think that's the harder thing, too. I lost a bunch of weight years ago, and in general, I've always struggled with my weight and trying to keep that in check. I want to say that I'm going to go to the gym and I'm not ever going to go to the gym is the realistic answer. But being able to get on a diet is like much more feasible for me. What's yeah. What I had to do was get a trainer. Um, I'm seeing a guy three times a week now because, because of the obligation 
that it's his time. I'm not wasting his time. That yeah. helps me a lot. Otherwise, I wouldn't be going to the gym. Yeah, sure. Well, good for you for taking care Thank of yourself. You. What's your favorite part of your day? Oh, man. Uh, the end of the day. <laughs> When it's all over. The... Yeah, I'm not a like, super ambitious person. I would, <laughs> some people might describe me as somewhat lazy, which is fair. The best part of my day uh, is probably just chilling on the couch, knowing I've done what I need to do and playing a video game or watching TV or something. What's your favorite video game? I play old school games. So I have an original Nintendo. Oh, cool. From, I think we've owned it. It was my sister's. I think we've had it since like 1986 or say 87. I took it with me. So I'll play like Mario, Blades of Steel, Sick. Kung Fu, Karate Kid. But didn't they like remake? Didn't they make a system that's like the Nintendo Classic? Oh yeah, I then... could I could play it on an emulator or something. Yeah, but yeah. I've got the cartridges. The thing works. Well, dude, like the, the fact feel. that it still works is mind blowing. It is. What's the worst part of your day? Uh, going to sleep. I have a hell of a time falling asleep. You haven't figured out your routine. Yeah. I'm well, I guess because you travel, it's not like you have the same. You can't fi- like funnel in a routine. Yeah, I know some people can can go to bed and fall asleep within like 20 minutes, and I'm met, mystified by that. Like, I go to bed, I'm up for another good probably two hours. Oh, God. Trying to fall asleep. I thankfully am in a, a good spot with that. That's what's lucky. What's the most underrated state that you've performed in? Underrated state that I've performed in? I had a really good time in Iowa, surprisingly. Really? Um, Des Moines? Yeah, Des Moines, Davenport. Um, who am I forgetting? Sioux City was kind of cool, but I think it was, I want to say it was Des Moines that I thought was was pretty cool. What was cool about it? Was it just the crowd? Yeah, the crowd, nice people, and then going out afterwards to some of the local watering holes. We had a good time. Sure. I was, uh, you know, driving through Iowa. I was like, didn't have high hopes because right, it's yeah. just a big cornfield, but I was surprised by Sometimes that's what makes there. like the little dive bars and stuff the most fun though, is because the people there aren't pretentious and they want to see like the people that are coming through. They're excited about yes. the show, you know yep. what I mean? So they're more appreciative of it, and it just makes the whole atmosphere. It's way a lot better. of fun. Like yeah. uh, people that were there that were at they were at the show, and they're happy that you're there. They're happy they're coming to your bar, and the owner's happy to have you. And it's usually a lot of fun, you know. Yeah, that's how it is in Eau Claire. What's your biggest pet peeve? Oh, um, I got a lot of them, uh, probably tailgating people that ride your ass when you're already going above the speed limit. It's kind of standard in Massachusetts, but other than that, I'd say probably, um, people that are making like mouth noises and they're not aware of it. (laughs) There's a thing called misophenia, which is like a very irrational ad state of agitation. So like. Someone who makes a lot of noise when they eat yeah, infuriates me. <laughs> Which you're stuck in a vehicle with people. Is there anybody that goes on tour that is the culprit of that? No, I don't think any of them are loud eaters, but I've had some You wouldn't friends, be on tour with them if they were. I mean, it's just <laughs> deafening to me. And I'm sure no one else is bothered by it, but yeah. to me it's all I can hear. And I sure. just want to shake them and be like, let me show you how to eat. <laughs> any I'm, mouth I'm an breather? Are there any mouth breathers in that group? No, I'm probably a mouth breather. <laughs> okay. So what's the best thing about Boston? Because the worst, I'm assuming, is the tailgaters. What's the best thing about Boston? Uh, the best thing about Boston for me is the history. Um, there's so much history there. There's so many cool things you can do pertaining to the history of the Revolutionary War. Right. Um, a lot of that spills out of Boston proper into some of the suburbs where the actual engagements and stuff took place but the history there is it's such an old city by american standard it's an ancient city so that yeah. that's cool to me so then what's the best thing about wisconsin i like the layout of the roads uh, boston is basically a just complete nonsense chaos the roads you know were built over hundreds of years they were used for cows and now we got people driving trucks on them wisconsin was a city that was or Milwaukee the city that was built so much later and they actually thought out the grid the the flow of traffic and the and the design of the city and that's what I like about Milwaukee and the ample parking you can always find parking sure yeah I mean I think the best part about Wisconsin is the fact that it's not competitive 
I not think, really, I think no. when, when people talk about Midwest nice, I think that's the biggest part of it mm-hmm. is that people just aren't as stressed out because it's not as competitive. No, so then not. it doesn't bleed into every conversation that people have. Right. And people don't feel like they're in as much of a hurry. Right. Um, there's less of an edge to people. There are nice people everywhere. There's plenty of wonderfully nice people in Boston, but there are also an incredible number of assholes. Sure. Um, so there's an edge there because there's less space. There's more people. Um, it takes forever to get places because of traffic. So the, here there's just a little bit of a slower yeah. pace of life. It's not going to be the end of the world if we don't do this right now or whatever. If you're eventually not a bachelor and you settle down, where are you going to settle down? Would you rather buy a house, raise kids here or out in Boston? I would be indifferent. Uh, it would really depend on the person, you know? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, if somebody really wanted to live here, I, I'd be fine with that. I mean, I love it here. I think my preference would be probably ending up back in Boston. Oh, okay. Eventually, only because that's where all my family and extended family is. Yeah, makes and I sense. want to be around them, you know? Sure. But that's the great thing about um, Milwaukee and Boston is they're far apart by car, but a flight is like two hours. Yeah, sure. And Milwaukee, um, General Mitchell, best airport in the country, by my opinion. Really? And they were actually just rated one of the best airports. MSP is Minneapolis, always is rated. I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Logan is a nightmare in Boston, an (laughs) absolute nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Um, But the flight, like when I get on, I can get to General Mitchell like 45 minutes before my flight. I'm always fine. Two hours later, I'm in Boston. Yeah, that's not bad at all. So let's talk goals and what's next. What's happening? Are you going to, do you have another tour with Charlie that's coming up? Or are you going to be doing your own thing for a little while? What can people expect the next like six months? Say, I'm going to keep cranking out sketches. That's the, that's the goal. Um, definitely want to do more stand up. Um, whatever dates Charlie puts me on, I take them. I will be doing the new England dates with him. We're doing Boston and Portsmouth, New Hampshire in the fall. But yeah, in the meantime, I'm aspiring to just keep putting content out and try to get to some smaller clubs, whether I'm performing or even just watching, trying to do a lot more of that. Actually going to go to an open mic tonight and just watch. Um, And uh, just keep keep doing what I'm doing. And then put out a comedy album. Maybe put out a comedy album. You could Um, learn some things from Adam. Yeah, yeah. I, that could be fun. I want, actually that's, you bring that up. I would like to also get more, um, just so my music edge doesn't dull. You yeah. know, I would like to record some more bands too. Oh, so sure. I've got one band I'm recording right now. So just keep that in the fold, like make sure I'm still doing the music thing too. Cause like that really is my passion. Yeah. It's really the music. So I don't want to let that slip away. Right. So integrating that into the comedy is probably a great yeah and I, I think when you do that it helps like creatively anyways mm-hmm. you know what i mean because you get burnt out on any individual thing there's a yeah. lot of people that like the basis of the show is to kind of inspire people to chase their dreams as far as a career yeah. but it is true that a lot of people if they try to make their passion a, into a career it they lose the passion for it yeah because it's so much that's just going into that one thing that was purely about love before and now it isn't so if you can balance between a few things it takes the pressure off of it and that yeah. way you can still kind of enjoy it. it's how i am with the show and with artwork and stuff too yes if i knew that my full income depended on doing artwork i feel like i would lose a lot of the joy for it yeah and you know both um um comedy and music are therapeutic things yeah. So like, no matter how frustrated or pissed off I am, I still pick up my acoustic guitar at home and play it every night. And um, so even if I get burned out doing a session here and I'm looking at a computer screen doing Pro Tools for eight hours, when I get home, I'm burned out on that, but I still take pleasure in just strumming my guitar, and, yeah. you know? Yeah, sure. Well, let's talk about what it makes it all worth it. I told you about this question. I ask this on every show. Can you share a unique experience that happened to you that you're really grateful for, but it only happened because you chose this career path? Yeah. I don't know if it's that astounding a story, but it meant a lot to me. Um, I mentioned earlier that we moved around a lot as kid, as a kid, and that was not easy. Like it's, it's hard to move and, and make new friends and start everywhere. But I had always wanted to get back to, uh, we lived in Portland, Oregon when I was a kid. 
And I always wanted to get back there and see my childhood home, but I never had any opportunity to do that. And I certainly wasn't going to get an opportunity to do that. But I ended up being on a show with Charlie in the Pacific Northwest, including Portland. So I had a day off. I rented a car and just drove to my old neighborhood. Yeah. It just kind of stood there and looked around, went to my old school and all that stuff. And it was just, it was cool. It was like I scratched an itch that I'd had for a long time. Sure. A nostalgic kind of revisit my, one of my childhood homes. Yeah. And it was cool. I drove over there. I pulled into the cul-de-sac. Everything felt way smaller because I'm tall and not a child anymore. <laughs> and I'm standing in the cul-de-sac looking at my old house, memory lane, thinking about where we used to play and all that. Then I realized it's the middle of the afternoon and I'm just some random guy in a rental minivan staring at someone's <laughs> house. So Great. I decided I'll probably wrap this up, took a couple of pictures and got out of there. But that was nice for me. It was, not, it was a nice experience to have seen, you know, one of my old houses that yeah. I kind of longed for, for whatever reason. Your job gave you an excuse to do that. Yeah. And yeah. I had seen most of my other houses that I lived in growing sure. up for one reason or another, but that was nice. Yeah. yeah, man. Well, and hopefully there's just like limitless travel ahead of you. I, I'm enjoying the traveling. I've gotten to see a lot of the country, places I would have never been. Um, I've gotten to check off a bunch more states I've never been to. How many states have you been to? Do you have a number? I don't know. I've probably been to, uh, I've probably been to like 36 of them. That's the exact number I've been to. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, there's always a few you forget about. Sure. Like technically I've been to New Orleans, but I mean, Louisiana. But it was just a stop on a cruise ship. Sure. So I'd like to experience that. I went there for Mardi Gras last year. That'd be fun. It was a wild time. If you could pick one city anywhere in the world to to perform, what's one that's on the bucket list? In the world, I would want to go to either Dublin. Yeah, because you're Irish. Yeah, Yeah. because of of Irish descent. And I've heard it's just a really fun city. (laughs) Yeah. And the Irish people just seem like a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah. And the Irish folks I've met, actual Irish folks, you know, not Boston, Boston yeah. Irish like me, they just have fun people. Yeah. They're having a good time. They got good personalities and seem to have a zest for life. And I just want to see Dublin uh, or London. I think you would. I think you would really love Edinburgh as well. I was going to say Scotland. Edinburgh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Scottish people have a little bit more of an edge on them. I think yeah. than Irish, but in a fun way. I was going like, to say Glasgow, but I have heard Glasgow's Ed- dope too. Edinburgh, I'd love to. That'd well, Edinburgh fantastic. is a lot more history. Okay. Like so, the Edinburgh Castle changed hands between the Scots and the English a bunch of times over the years, uh, and it's okay. built on top of what was a volcano. Oh, okay. And it's like a, looks like a bat. Well, cause there were a lot of battles there, but it's like a true castle up on top of the hill. That's cool. Right. So that part of it. And then they're like the whole, like they call it the old capital, but the old part of the city, like that is all still cobblestone and everything from like way, way, way back when. So that there's like ton like to of history, but then the other part of the, the, the city is like true city. So it would be nice to get there. out and see either the Scottish or the Irish because we share that common bond of our hatred for the English. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. I think it'd be funny. No, though. we love the English, I but think, you know, they had yeah. their problems. I think you guys need to do some skits, you and Charlie of, cause I've seen them of like Wisconsin guy in LA or whatever. I think you need to do that internationally. That'd That's the next fantastic. thing. International tours and then go to Berlin and do content like that. that people would love it. Would be fun. Yeah. I will. I would support that hundred percent. So how are people going to see that happen? Can you give a shout out to all your different outlets, how people can support you and like follow you moving forward? Yeah. I mean, I, just following and liking is really the the way to keep moving for me. Um, they can find me on Instagram, Billy Deuce. Is it? It might have Billy Deuce eighty six. I think it's Billy Deuce yeah. eighty six. And I'm on the TikTok. I'm same on, handle. Yep, same handle. I'm on YouTube. I believe it's the same handle. Yeah. And uh, the Facebook. And I'm also on X, but I've never logged in. Someone made it for me and does the posting for me. Oh, cool. X is what they call Twitter now, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If fine. they wanted to reach out, what's the best one? Like if they if they had a question, they're like, Chris oh. didn't ask this at all. What's the best way to get a hold of Oh, me? yeah. You can just DM just, me on Instagram. Instagram's the one? Yeah, I keep that inbox empty. I usually reply to everybody that texts or sends me a message when I can. So, so. it wasn't special that you replied to me. No, no, I, I <laughs> well, reply. Well, unless it's, you know, some people will send some weird shit and I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah, stay yeah. away from that one. But sure. no, I try to answer 
uh, the inbox on um, Instagram. Dope. So, yeah. Well, yeah. And then follow over at YouTube and everything. You can find Passion Pod literally everywhere. YouTube's the platform that I'm pushing really heavy and working on. Um, and then, yeah, actually hit the subscribe button. That's really helpful. Liking, commenting, and then sharing. Those are all the easy ones. You can also find Passion Pod on Patreon. But if you just go to like me on Instagram, just Passion Pod, there's a link to all that different stuff. And there's merchandise you can buy and you can donate to the show if you really wanted to. You can send me a nasty message if you wanted to. Whatever. Either way, I'm also posting. Um, um, more than three clips a week because I'm cutting up episodes, but posting very frequently, especially over on YouTube. So find Sweet. that platform and then, uh, yeah, go drop little fire emojis on every single one of our videos for us. Pretty nice. And thank you. Dope, dude. Well, thanks so much for having me again. Yeah. This was a, an awesome time. Glad we were able to make it work. Yeah, for sure. No, well, this was fun. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Passion Pod. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We'll see you soon.